In this territory are the dog-headed people. Here live the griste, and extremely wicked people, for among other vile things they do, they make clothes for themselves and saddles for their horses out of the skins of their enemies. The east to west extent of Europe, from the outlet of the Sea of Azov to the Strait of Gibraltar, in a straight line, is 3,427 miles. Hungarians. Slavs. Ostrich. Head of a goose, body of a crane, feet of a calf. It eats iron. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we're looking at the Hereford Mundi. It's an odd little kind of book, isn't it? Well, it's... Uh, it's very thin for a book, and in that there's only the one page, but it's a very large page. There's a lot on the page. There's a lot of text on the page, and the uh, the book that transcribes it, which we'll be looking at uh, by Scott D. Westrom, is uh, is a really big book. <laughs> it is a sort of full-size book of, it's like 500 pages, but they're very thick stock. And then tightly packed. Yes. Um But yeah, no, we are looking at a map for our third and final episode in the cluster on history. And this seems appropriate. It's a historical object, but it's also an object that tells history in its own interesting way. Yeah, it tells history. It also kind of invokes history. One of the things I I expect we'll be talking about with regard to the Hereford map is the way in which its rubrics kind of invite the reader to... I don't know, it's almost, I don't want to compare it to hyperlinks exactly, but it kind of connects you to a a whole range of other textual traditions. Um, So it's almost like, I don't know, like pushing a button when you see a particular rubric on the map. It opens up a door to a whole other text or even set of texts. And uh, that feature, I think, is really interesting. Like it makes history. It doesn't just tell history. It kind of makes it in some kind of way. Yeah, I think both through these suggestive texts, the rubrics on the map, and also just the way that things are organized. I mean, they're organized geographically, but geographic accuracy is not what this map is primarily interested in. It's interested in the details that it finds along the way, the stories that it can locate in different places around the world as it understands it. Yeah, and I, maybe I can say a little bit about um, medieval maps uh, in general and the Hereford in particular. But before then, I want to notice something else about this episode. Uh, it's the last one in our cluster of um, episodes on history, but it's also our 50th episode. So <laughs> happy 50th. Happy 50th. We've <laughs> done a lot of talking. That's what we do. <laughs> We've done, even in just our main episodes, that's over two solid days of talking. Oh my God. <laughs> Never mind all the bonus bits and so forth. Yeah. No, it's good. And and I've, I've appreciate everybody who said very nice things about the show and who've, you know, written nice reviews on iTunes and told their friends about it and tweeted at them and all that stuff. It's really appreciated. We're glad to see the podcast is growing and the listeners are growing and we love hearing from you all. So thank you. Yeah, it keeps us going. And, you know, for, I mean, speaking for myself, and I think maybe you feel the same way, Chris, like it's really fun to have these conversations together, but it's also really great to feel as if it's connecting with other people and kind of, I don't know, providing a conversation that people like to join. Um, And so when we hear things from our listeners, it really helps us keep going. Yeah. And thank you to everybody who has gone the extra mile and decided to help support us and our network on Patreon. Mm. So patreon.com slash megaphonic FM if you tune out when I'm talking very fast at the end of the show. So let me say a little bit of something about medieval maps. Um, and, but before I get started, Chris, have you spent a lot of time with medieval maps? Uh, I, I want to say of myself that I've perhaps spent a little too much time with medieval maps. I have probably not spent as much time as you have, but I have spent a certain amount of time with them because I am generally speaking a big fan of maps. When I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a writer. And then I realized eventually that I kind of hate writing. But what I, (laughs) what, but what drew me in was reading fantasy books with maps in them and the stories that you could get from those maps and how the, how the map in the front of the book and the story itself connected. So yeah. so maps have always been a really sort of exciting thing for me as a as a reader even. And medieval maps are uh, there aren't enough of them, uh, mm-hmm. but they often are quite fabulous to look at. Certainly the most famous ones including including this one and the Catalan Atlas and a few of the other ones are just delightful to pour over. 
Yeah. So um, I'll resist the temptation to talk about them at too great a length, but um, medieval maps, the important thing to know about them is that they're not so much guides to navigation as they are a kind of image of the world. So they give you a big picture of how everything fits together. And especially the more detailed ones, um, you could really describe them as encyclopedic. They're capacious and also they're about organizing knowledge and giving you often, like I said, kind of a theory of everything. How does it all fit together? And there's a lot to say about that. Um, among medieval maps, there are three main types. One of them is the zonal map. And basically that's oriented the way we orient maps today with north at the top. And it sort of lays out climate zones. Uh, usually it can be three, it can be five, but the idea is that they're colder ones are closer to the poles in the north and the south. There's a hot zone in the middle uh, around the equator and then temperate zones. And so that style of map goes back to antiquity and we, we continue to see that right through the medieval period. There's also what are called portolan maps, which kind of give you a more precise and numerically consistent way of measuring distances between points. So those are actually useful as practical guides to navigation, and they show up right at the end of the Middle Ages. But the other kind of map, and this is the context for the Hereford map, is what are sometimes called TO maps um, or map by Mundi, world maps. And they call them TO because if you think of the map itself as kind of being in the shape of a circle and you imagine a T shape in the middle of it, it's got three continents and they're arranged uh, at, above the crossbar of the T and on either side of the middle bar. And these maps, these um, TO maps or Map by Mundi, are east oriented. Like they're literally oriented, like the orient is the reference point at the top of the map. So I remember when I first started looking at medieval world maps, I would always like tilt my head to the side so I could look at the map. <laughs> as you know, to put north on top, as it were. So I was looking at it that way um, and could make sense of what I was looking at. Um, but now I'm so accustomed to them that I don't have to do that anymore. So the Hereford is a kind of very elaborate TO map. And as I mentioned, they get called Map by Mundi, which I think is such a neat term. I mean, it just means kind of, it's a synonym for world map, but it recalls the way in which the word mapa in Latin actually means like a kind of a cloth or a textile. And again, coming back to this idea of like, is a map a book? Yeah, it's a book, but it's also like a cloth or a covering or this kind of, I don't know, capacious cloak, so to speak. Like, I just think that that sort of physical nature of the map and Mundi is such an interesting thing to think about and um, the way in which it kind of has this two-dimensional quality that opens out into all these other dimensions of time. Um, I could say a little bit about the Hereford map in particular, and I, I won't go on about it in detail, but just a little bit about it in particular. It's pretty massive. It is not the most massive monumental map that was ever made. The Epsdorf map, which was unfortunately lost during Allied bombing in World War II, was really big. It was like 12 feet in diameter. The Hereford map's not quite so big. It's about five feet by maybe four and a half feet. And it was made just before 1300. So it had, it's maybe it's what, 725, 720 years old right now. And it's been at Hereford Cathedral, certainly since the 1600s and probably earlier. It could even have been made there, but there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly where it was made. Um, some speculation that it may have been made in Lincoln, but it's an, it's an English map. And I mention this and kind of emphasize it because when you look at the map itself and you look at the British Isles, they're really detailed. And that might be an area of the map we talk about in some detail. Um, it was uh, presented originally in a wooden frame, and actually the old frame survives, even though it was uh, replaced into a new frame. The old one was found sort of in the barn or something like that at Hereford Cathedral. Um, and it, what's interesting about that, it shows us that the map was displayed in a triptych where there's this wooden frame, the map was in the center, and uh, the angel Gabriel was at the left and the Virgin Mary at the right, which means that it was kind of an annunciation scene, right? The map was the center of a scene of the Annunciation. And so when we think about what the map is doing in terms of space and time and salvation history. Uh, I think that's a really interesting aspect. Uh, let's just think, well, what's that map for? Is it for teaching or is it in some ways also a kind of devotional object? Like, would you contemplate the map? And I think that's neat to think about. Um, nobody paid any attention to it for some hundred years. But then in the early 19th century, it did start getting attention again. It was displayed, it became studied, and was hidden for safety during World War II and then redisplayed in the cathedral in 1948. People were drawn to it, as I say, but nonetheless, the cathedral almost had to sell it in 1989 because they need to pay for repairs on the building. And luckily, funds were raised, and it's now beautifully displayed in Hereford Cathedral. And you can access it through the digital site, um, which we're going to link in the show notes. And then also, as you mentioned, in Scott Westrom's facsimile edition, which is a little bit cumbersome to use in some ways, but it is full of useful detail. So if anybody falls in love with the map, that's a really good book to spend some time with. 
Yeah, Westrom's book is uh, – it, it is a large book. It is a hard-to-use book. It has what I would describe as fairly accurate reproductions of the Mappa Mundi, which unfortunately is a very dingy object. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of hard to read uh, because there's so much – darkness on it. There have been some reproductions of it that have tried to bring out the original colors mm -hmm. or not have the vellum sort of brownishness in the background so that you have a much more contrast. And they're really interesting. There is a very detailed reproduction on Wikipedia that it does allow you to see a lot of detail, um, but it's really big and it keeps mm -hmm. crashing my computer when I try yeah. to open it. So, uh, you know, I'll link to it, but be wary. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it is a very handy guide. And once you sort of start going down a path if you if you're sort of looking at the map and sort of imagining an itinerary uh it's very enticing to just kind of browse it and i think the book really allows you to do that i mean obviously the map does it better but the book does a pretty good job of it and also the book had to make some choices yeah. in terms of what order that it's going to put all these items in and so it does create little paths as well through each of the sort of regions which is great although it does mean that you miss out on some of the interactions that are happening between regions. Uh, but that's okay. You can, you could work with it. Yeah, I know. It's like a whole bunch of things that are in my mind, you know, in response to what you just said. Well, one is that that book came out in 2001 when the options for online display of the map were significantly more limited. So it has to be kind of, you know, they'll give you illustrations of the map as a whole and then sections of it. And then the rubrics, he'll transcribe them, you know, section by section, right? But now, and I have to say how much I love this, you know, if you go on the virtual map site, you know, you just sort of call up the Hereford map and you make it big with your fingers, at least on my laptop, you make it big with your fingers and then you just move Move around and it's like it's so tactile and so nice and I have to say I enjoy the Hereford map way more than I've ever enjoyed it before in my life even though I've been looking at it for like I don't know 25 years because um I, you know like I got really into medieval maps I spent a lot of time with them but the Hereford map was like always such a drag to deal with because it was so difficult it was such a you know sort of because of the contrast issues you were mentioning and like the obscure, like I'd go in and get a couple pieces of information here and there, but I wouldn't really luxuriate in the map. And now I'm like, you know, Oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish it had the transcriptions. On that. I know. I know that's something that's got to be improved, but it could be um, something they're planning to implement. So maybe in time. And also you get just get a sense of just um, ease of movement. So one of the things that, um, you know, again, coming back to Westrom's facsimile version, he kind of breaks it up into sections, you know, sort of working his way down from the top of the map and then sort of through the layers of Asia and then down on the left through the layers of Europe. And then he goes over to the right and goes down through the layers of Africa. And, and not to quibble, but I find that kind of frustrating because one of the things um, that's really striking about medieval world maps is they kind of have a way they want you to read them. I mean, there's many possible ways to read them. But if you look at prose map by Mundi, that is um, texts that give you the information that's in the world map sort of in order, they're almost like either guides to reading or guides to making these world maps. Like, so they give you a sense of what the order uh, would be for people. Um, they start at the top, like at 12 o'clock of the map, and they work their way through Asia. And then they go uh, counterclockwise through Europe, all the way down to the West, and then they come back up again through Africa, right? Sort of upward, you know, again, continuing counterclockwise on the clock face so that you both begin in the East and then you end up again in the Southeast. So you start with Paradise or Eden, right, at the very top of the map, the beginning of space and time, and then you come all the way around and you end up in the remote towards Southeastern regions where it's like India and Ethiopia and all these like sites of luxurious richness and weirdness, um, which is, you know, at the threshold of paradise. So, so you know, that's that's one little quibble I have with the ways in which he's organized the layers. Uh, but otherwise, I think it's really useful. And there's so many other ways into the map. And before we start going into the map, there's one other thing I want to point out, which is uh, you described TO maps, and this is basically a, a very elaborate TO map. But just to, just to clarify sort of what you were saying, you, know, you imagine, you know, the map itself, it sort of looks like a child's drawing of a house, right? It's got a square with a little hat on top of it. And inside of that is the circle, which is the map itself. And then there's sort of a lot of text and drawings of angels and all sorts of things around the edges uh, and a few other things that might be interesting. But the map itself is a big circle. And then you have to imagine a line sort of bisecting the circle from left to right. Yeah. And those are the understood as the rivers, the Don River at the left and the Nile River at the right. Exactly. And then the, the half circle at the top is Asia 
And then you imagine the line going from the middle to the bottom. And then on one side, you have Europe. And on the other side, you have Africa with the Mediterranean splitting them up. And this is a very geometric understanding of this circle of land, which, you know, isn't even really a circle, of course, no. but that's fine. And in the middle of that, at the place where Europe, Africa, and Asia meet, is Jerusalem, which is, of course, a very significant city for Christian, Jewish, and Muslim Europe mm -hmm, at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a sort of logic in terms of the form. And that up front is telling you that that's what this is most interested in, that it's not meant to be what we would consider. It's not meant to be Google Maps, mm -hmm. right? It's not no. meant to reproduce. It's not meant to help you get from point A to point B in a physical sense at all. Mm -hmm. But in a spiritual sense, maybe, yes. And and to understand how all the parts relate to one another, sure. It's it's a sort of mathematical simplification or or interpretation of the world. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's meant to show you the shape of the world, your place in it in physical and spiritual terms. I mean, that's what the Mappa Mundi is for. And that's a pretty ambitious undertaking, right? To tell you about everything and you <laughs> in <laughs> spiritual and, you know, um, physical terms. But it kind of does the job in the most interesting kind of way. And like you're saying, I think it's, I'm looking at the whole map, like in the overview of the map right now. And it's, again, it's doing the synoptic thing, you know, where you see the whole world in a glance. That frame is doing certain kinds of work, right? Where the images of, at the very top, there's an image of the last judgment. So it's sort of a, a scene of the enthroned Christ. He's got at his left hand, the people who are being cast off into the abyss. Um, some angels are delivering that bad news. And at his right hand, so our left, the um, other angels are delivering the good news of salvation to those who are emerging at the time of the resurrection, right? They're coming out of their tombs and heading off into eternal bliss. And there's also an image of Mary there who's speaking to her son, the enthroned Christ, in French, right? Because the rubrics here are going to be in Latin, and then these ones here in French, um, and some of the place names are kind of Englishy in their own way. Um, so it's a it's a text that's speaking in a lot of different tongues, and it's invoking a lot of different kinds of messages, and it's framing its message in explicitly in terms of salvation history. Well, with all that in mind. Let's figure out a good place to start on the map, and maybe we'll walk through it. I mean, especially because this is a fairly difficult text in some ways for readers to approach themselves, let's just sample what reading it or what taking a walk through the map is like. And I figure there's a lot of places. You have so many options for where to begin. There isn't an obvious start here point, but one potentially obvious point would be the top of the map which is where you'll find a circular walled island, which is Eden. Yeah, it's walled, um, beautifully kind of crenellated, almost like the ramparts of a city in black ink, and then with red decorative ink around the edge of it, which sort of suggests to us that it's an important place, but it's also a sealed, closed place. And that's really important in medieval understandings of Eden. So for example, like in Mandeville's Travels, he has a beautiful section where he talks about, he says, I have heard a lot about the earthly paradise, but I have never been there because no man can enter. And he talks about how it was sealed off at a certain time. And if you look at that sort of island shape, you see at the bottom of it, the gates of paradise which are shut, barred and shut. And you also see the rivers of paradise, Tigris, Euphrates, Phison, and Gion sort of marked off there. And the reason those are so incredibly important is that the rivers are kind of doing the opposite of what the walls are doing. The walls are telling us about how Eden is sealed off, closed. It's a kind of a microcosm, a little tiny circle that um, corresponds to the big circle of the whole wide world. And the rivers are not bounded within the, the garden. They, on the contrary, go throughout the whole world. Medieval textual traditions talk about how the four rivers of paradise come up as the four great rivers in the rest of the world, the Don, the Nile, um, and so on, right? So Eden is doing a lot of work there in a really neat kind of way. It's also got an image of Adam and Eve. Yeah. So it's pointing us toward that story, right? Exactly. But Adam and Eve aren't sort of stuck here because they reappear just on the other side after they've been expelled from Eden. Yeah, they look depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you, if you cross over, if you leave Eden and you head south. Yeah, just at the lower right, as if it was around 4.30 or 5 o'clock on the clock face of Eden. There's the angel with the sword. He looks kind of sorry about this, but, you know, you got to go. And then they're <laughs> being cast out, right? And next to them are a couple of dog-headed people. Yeah. 
as as there are. <laughs> and on the other side of that, you find uh, an early city. You find Enos, which is the oldest city founded by Cain, the son of Adam and Eve. Exactly. So you've got a whole story going on here, right? Like, so it's the story of Eden, the creation of mankind, the fall and the gates being sealed shut, um, their um, emergence from Eden, their um, the patrimony that comes from them, right? Their son, Cain, and the city that he founds. And then the river is being there, as I mentioned. They're kind of taking you out into the world. They're pointing you outward into the world, uh, which is where, also where Adam and Eve are going. And, um, you know, again, giving us a sense of the interconnected world. And so, you know, obviously the Bible is the main point of reference here, but it, there's a whole textual tradition, there's a whole set of stories that were being kind of triggered to remember and to think about and maybe even retell. Yeah. And then I was really struck that just next to that, mm -hmm. we start seeing... Uh, a few other things from a, a slightly different story tradition. We see the arbor balsami, the dry tree, mm -hmm. and we see, well, we see, we see a few things, but the dry tree that's right there is coming from the Alexander the Great tradition. Yeah. And also a little bit below that, sort of to the right and below Adam and Eve, there are the altars of Alexander. So you know how I was mentioning earlier when we encouraged to read the map, you know, in a way that starts at the top of the map, moves through Asia, then heads through Asia toward the northeast, and then down through Europe, and then through Africa, and then back up into Asia. What you're you're kind of jumping to the end of the story here is what you're doing, which is totally fine. That's also one of the possible itineraries, right? Um, going from the beginning point to what's going to be kind of the end point of the counterclockwise journey through the map, where we get to the remotest southeast, these areas that are like torrid, they're at the edge of the world. They're, they're dangerous places, and Alexander the Great is tremendously associated with those stories. Yeah, although it is interesting that, uh, if that's true, and, I, and I'm sure that's the tradition, but the image of Adam and Eve having been just expelled. Yeah, they're walking right into it. <laughs> is on the is at the end, right? It's on the other side of the of the dry tree. It's at, yeah. it's at the very end of the story. If you go counterclockwise around the entire map, then you would reach the expulsion. So there are narrative elements telling you to go the other way as well. Well, that's what I think that's one of the things that I think is so incredibly cool about these maps. Like on the one hand, there are these sort of I guess shiny points, you know, starting points, like obvious points that want to catch your attention. Eden at the top is one. Jerusalem at the center is another one. Um, the uh, really vivid Red Sea that's at the upper right, you know, they, they catch your eye and they invite you in. But there's also so much of a kind of choose your adventure quality to this thing, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you could go this way, you could go this way, you could go this way. And they all are these marvelous possibilities. There is also, if you keep going counterclockwise, sort of following the story as you've been putting it out, uh, before too long, and I'm not sure, I can't quite find it right now off the top of my fingers, but uh, there is an island which includes an altar that Alexander put up. Mm -hmm. That's in the far north. There's, there's two altars of Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. So, th so it's not, uh, again, sort of that sense of linearity. Like there may be a general trend to go counterclockwise, but it's not... You're not locked into that. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of other kind of itineraries that jump out. I feel like um, one of the ones that's also works really well is the top to bottom itinerary that's not so much in terms of salvation history, but is kind of telling you history in another kind of way. So if we again start with Eden, like we did earlier, um, looking at the very top of the map, and we just sort of move our way downward, um, you run into the big fancy uh, Tower of Babel. Yeah, I mean, you see it's like this like big monumental kind of structure. It's one of the most beautiful, fancy um, structures of all. And it says Terra Babyloni to the side, so the, the land of Babylon. And then there's um, Taurus Babel, uh, the Tower of Babel. And medieval people kind of assimilated the Tower of Babel to Babylon, the city. They kind of understood them as one single thing. And um, there's a lot to say about Babylon, right? But anyway, so if you keep going down from Babylon, then you're going to also run into the, again, very beautiful sort of symbolic form of Jerusalem at the center of the map. And by at the center of the map, I mean really like at the center of the map. It's it's um, drawn with a compass, and you can see you still see the pinprick of the compass at the center, so that the city itself is a perfect circle. And we might want to talk about what that's what that's about. And then if you keep going down, you come through uh, the Mediterranean and you hit the um, city of Rome, right? which is described as being kind of like in its own special way, a kind of center. It's also a kind of uh, center of the world in its own way. And then if you keep going down, down from there, you continue through the Mediterranean and you end up not at a city, but at a kind of a portal, which are the um, pillars of Hercules, so the um, Straits of Gibraltar. 
And so, you know, that's another way of reading the map that's not so much about salvation as history as it's about what's sometimes called translatio imperi, like um, the big empires of the world. So if you think about Babylon and Rome in particular, one of the Hereford Map's main sources or kind of intertext is Orosius's world history. It's a sort of history that's written shortly after the time of Augustine, and it basically tells the history of the world, right? So it's a universal history. And there, Babylon and Rome are the two great opposing cities, you know, one far in the east, one far in the west, both seats of empire. And um, that trajectory, that itinerary that goes straight down, it's not about the Bible, right? But it's about history that can be read on the map in another kind of way, from another kind of source. Absolutely. Now, you just took some very big strides across the map. I know. I'm all the way at the bottom of the map now. The, yeah, you're, you were looking for the big highlights. Um, and there are a few other highlights along the way in terms of big cities and places of import, which uh, we might get to. But I do want to talk about that because I have to say the Straits of Gibraltar were where my eye more naturally landed at first before I realized that there was something very cool at the top of the map. The Straits of Gibraltar are really interesting. Also, like just in terms of my sense of maps, like uh, it's easier for me to figure out where things are if I start in a part of the world that I'm a little more familiar with. So, yeah. but, but even more than that, the Mediterranean on this map is thick with islands. Oh, it's full. It's very full. It's, it's, it's packed to the brim with islands yeah. and they pop out really excitingly. They, they're, they're much more enticing to look at in many ways than the, than the major land masses. And, and they're so great. There's like islands, but there's also like big giant fish. There's a mermaid. Yeah. There's all kinds of great stuff in here. So, so yeah, so some of the islands that, I, that I'm seeing here, uh, we've got sort of the first islands you encounter are the Balearic Islands, Mallorca, Menorca, and Ibiza. And they're all just big triangles, and <laughs> that's fine. Uh, and then you get to a few of the other. It's a whole whole mess of little islands underneath. You've got Sardinia, uh, which is pretty large and has a nice description of, you know, where the name Sardinia comes from and its dimensions. And you've got a bunch of really tiny islands underneath them that I do not recognize at all. I'm not saying that they're not real, but they are. <laughs> they're not. I, even as someone of a geography nerd, that's a lot more islands than I think of being in that part of the Mediterranean. You can never have too many. No, that's true. <laughs> and then if you go up, you, you you eventually will reach the giant triangle of Sicily, with, which has a lot of detail and a lot of, you know, it's got the volcano Mount Etna on and it's got a few other things. And also, isn't that like a kind of, you know, entry into hell there at the um, coming off the mountain? That's what that looks like to me there. Or it could be lava flowing out of it. I'm not even sure, but it's so cool. Oh, I just thought that was a river. It might be, but yeah. Yeah, so cool. Uh, and then next to it, you've got this weird spiral. Yes. You know what that is? I do, but I had to look it up because I was too excited about that spiral. And I was like, <laughs> what is this snail? <laughs> no, of course, it's something much more interesting than that. Charybdis. It's Charybdis from the Odyssey. Yeah. Being the whirlpool here, right? And then there's also, I mean, there's Scylla as well, but then there's also an island of Calypso. I don't know if you saw that, which is uh, just below the uh, Mediterranean rubric. Yeah, it's so cool, right? There's all kinds of stuff in here. Yeah, you're getting all sorts of, of Greek and Roman mythology as well. And, and in fact, um, I think earlier on the map, way up north, there is a city that was founded by Dionysus. Mm, I didn't notice that. Which is interesting in a, in a Christian-oriented map to have something like that in there. Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty neat. They're willing to give the story that they're receiving from, you know, pagan, so to speak, heritage. But it, I don't know. It's just it's just moved in. It's a piece of information they have about the world and they want to include it. Yeah, that's what I meant by being encyclopedic. You know, the idea that every piece of knowledge can be organized into this system, right? It's one of the reasons I love medieval encyclopedias so much. We have to do Bartolome's Anglican subject because I love that so much. <laughs> um, it's the theory of everything, right? It will all fit if you just understand it correctly. You know, it will all fit. It all has a place. And, you know, among these many luxurious islands of the Mediterranean, my very favorite one is Crete, mm -hmm. um, which has all kinds of interesting locations that are part of the history of Crete. But it has my very favorite, uh, Labyrinthus Ides Domus Dedali, the labyrinth that is the house of Daedalus. And it's so beautifully drawn. It's this like really beautiful little maze. It's a perfect little maze. It, Isn't it, it beautiful? It is. It's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things on here in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Although partially that's because it is just so unexpectedly perfect. Like I'm sure it was made with a protractor if they were using one to make the overall circle. For sure. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It's, yeah. it's absolutely spot on, like protractor and rulers being used in a very thoughtful way to make this. And it just, again, it just sort of stands out. Like the, I mean, it works. You can actually do this puzzle. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and you sort of can compare it with the snail shape, the spiral of Charybdis. And like, that's clearly drawn freehand. And it's very nice. 
but this labyrinth is is it's it's just on a, a whole other scale. Well, I mean, it's doing like so many things. Okay, so one thing the labyrinth is doing is it's sending you back to the story of the Minotaur and the story of Daedalus, which is from Ovid's Metamorphoses. I mean, it comes through other sources as well, but that's the big place it comes through, and that's a really important text for medieval readers. Ovid, right? So, it's doing that, but it's also, um, like you said, doing this. It's got this visual logic, so it's let it, inviting you to compare it to the freehand drawing of Charybdis, just a little bit below and to the left. And it's also inviting you to compare it with some of the other perfect circular forms that we've seen on this map. Eden at the very top, which we were discussing earlier. Jerusalem at the very center, right? Also drawn with a compass, right? It's perfect circular form, right? Is doing cer- Each one of them is doing certain kinds of symbolic work, right? So it's kind of sending you back to the text, to Ovid's Metamorphoses, but it's also inviting you to put it into conversation with these other locations on the map. So trippy. Ah, oh, so good. Um, so good. There's just so much I like about it. There is also, I should add, uh, a series of islands that sort of go around the outside of the map, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially if you are starting at the bottom and then heading uh, counterclockwise, I guess, uh, around Africa. The Fortunate Islands and then a whole bunch of other ones. Yeah. And then you get into sort of uh, strangeness. So, you know, you're following these little islands. They have little descriptions. And then on the mainland, across from these islands, you start getting very strange human-esque hominid creatures, um, which are probably the things that are most famous about this map. Yeah. They, what's sometimes called the monstrous races, but I don't think people use that term so much anymore. There's a lot to say about what's going on there on that right-hand side of the map. So as you're mentioning, so if you look all the way at the right, you've got um, uh, water and then there are these islands sort of sprinkled throughout the water and they run along there. But then you've got a landform, but it's not completely connected to the main part of the landform of Africa. It's um, sort of semi-connected. There's a long river that's running along uh, that sort of right-hand side. So that that strip of land that's got the monstrous people on it is attached and not quite attached to the mainland form. And there's a lot to say about what's going on there. Other medieval world maps, among them some of my most very favorite medieval world, world maps, like the 12th century Libra Floridus world map, so great, um, actually give you the map in Mundi, but then they give you an extra fourth continent that would be sort of hypothesized as being below the equator, mm. right? And they'll label it things like, unknown to the sons of Adam due to the great heat. Right, right. right. So, so this is not quite doing that. It's not doing the fourth continent thing, but it's doing something a little bit like it. Like it's kind of reflecting an awareness of that idea of this extreme place that's, you know, barely part of the world. It's, it is and it isn't part of the world. And that's where monstrosity is. Yeah. And the monstrosities aren't just striking. I mean, they're still striking today. You've got the people with their faces on their chests and no heads. They're so beautifully drawn, right? It's not just the rubrics. You see these great pictures. Yeah. You see, yeah. The images of them are are, are terrific. Um, actually, they all look very friendly for, for monsters in, in many ways. Well, yeah, they look okay. <laughs> there are people who have, you know, animal parts. You've got some centaurs uh, deeper into the into the mainland i suppose but still uh you've got the people with hands on their heads is that what i'm seeing there yeah i don't know what that is man oh that these the one at the bottom he's got a lot of eyes <laughs> that's i don't think that's what i'm looking at right now yeah. um but yes um uh cyopods who though one-legged are extremely swift and are protected in shade by the soles of their feet also called monoculi which suggests they have one eye which okay um yeah, it's just it's just delightful. Mm-hmm. And one of the other kind of neat things to notice about the ways in which that is a part of the world and not quite part of the world, you know what I mean? It's attached and yet a little bit cut off, is if you go all the way up the sort of that, that strip of land up along the monstrous people, you'll notice there's a sort of the last of the islands tucked in in that watery space. It is uh, a long rubric that's about Ethiopia. Right. And, you know, the placement of Ethiopia on medieval maps is something I've been fascinated by for a long time. It'll be in Africa sometimes, but in Asia sometimes. Sometimes there'll be multiple Ethiopias. Sometimes Ethiopia will be conflated with India. Sometimes there's, of the three Ethiopias, one of them is Ethiopia Indie, you know? And so it's neat to think about the ways in which this is a site of sort of fantasy and monstrosity, but it's also a site where they put a part of the world that medieval European map makers understand this part of the world as incredibly remote, but also semi-known. Like they have certain points of reference for this part of the world. Um, It's really neat to think about how they navigate that partial knowledge, you know? So it's it's not a realm of pure fantasy, right? They have textual traditions for talking about Ethiopia, both scientific and biblical traditions, but they don't quite, quite grasp what it is that that part of the world has. 
The, I guess, extreme other side of that is if we look to where the map originates from. Which is exactly the opposite part of the world from there. Um, so that sort of torrid southeastern region where you have India, Ethiopia, these luxurious islands are full of wealth, the legends of Alexander the Great, uh, monstrosity, you know, all that stuff. That's the exact opposite side from where the British Isles are. And again, a text like Mandeville and also Bartholomew's Anglican Citizens Encyclopedia really go to town with that. They really make a lot out of that idea of these, this opposition. Mandeville even says when he's talking about Prester John's land, which is this sort of fantastical realm that was understood to be located in remotest India in the southeastern region, um, he'd say, it's exactly opposite between Prester John's land and where we are in England, he says, because just as far as you'd have to climb up from Prester John's land to get to Jerusalem at the center of the world, so too you'd have to go up from England to Jerusalem. And so they're like, it's like the two sides of a scale almost, right? They're like kind of balanced against one another. So seeing the Hereford map do that too is really neat. Yeah. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of space and detail given to the British Isles. Oh, it's insane. I mean, compared with anything else, it's 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 ridiculous um, how much yeah. loving attention is given to this. Uh, but it also makes perfect sense, you know, because after all, they have the most information about this. It is the most important to the people who are most likely to look at the map. Of course, you make it bigger. I mean, it's not trying to say this is a literally larger space than whatever, but it nevertheless is. It's, it's taking up a lot and. It has a tremendous amount of detail. Yeah. One of the things I was fascinated by as I was looking at the map again, you know, getting ready for today, is the way in which the British Isles really look like a lot of islands. I don't know if that struck you. Like, I mean, the the rivers and watercourses are kind of... I don't know, overinflated so that it's not just like you have the typical British Isles where you have like, you know, the one island that has, you know, Scotland and England and Wales on it and then Ireland over there and like the island of Man and stuff. The water courses that um, go through uh, the area separating England and Scotland are so inflated that Scotland itself almost looks like an island. And so too, um, the rivers that are in the very northern part of England almost cut it off from the other parts of England. Um, Wales too. Uh, Ireland seems to be cleft in two. As well. Absolutely, yeah. And again, these are, if you look at it closely, you see that these are just water courses. That's labeled as a river, right? Mm -hmm. But you get the effect of um, many islands. And I thought that was so fascinating. It's almost like a midi Mediterranean or something like that. Yeah, I, I, it feels like it's trying to show both how large and how, maybe how diverse mm -hmm. it is. If, mm -hmm. if, if you get the sense of this being a collection of, you know, eight to 12 different blobs, and you look at eight to 12 different blobs anywhere else on the map. It's going to, you know, it, it ends up carrying quite a lot of weight. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that idea that it's diverse, there's a lot of different qualities to it. Um, and uh, again, we mentioned earlier that, um, you know, the map is at Hereford now, but there was some speculation as to it, whether it might have been made at Lincoln. And one of the arguments for that was that Lincoln on the map, which is, you know, a city, but is not like a super, super big city, um, is drawn in a really uh, lavish way in this part of the map. It's quite a beautiful cathedral building. I, I also find it quite interesting that despite the amount of detail given to the British Isles, Paris across mm. the channel is just massive. It's so big. <laughs> it's just massive. And even Rouen on the way to Paris is larger than any city in England. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a sense of just the sheer sheer power of the land on the continent and their, their closest neighbors. I mean, Paris is bigger than Rome. Well, yeah. well, you know, I wonder if what's going on... So two things. One is that, you know, England is a backwater in this period. You know, I mean, that's all there is oh, to yeah. it, right? So that means... So that's just facts, right? Um, but with Paris, I wonder if what's going on there is not so much um, political preeminence that's being reflected there, but rather the seat of learning. I mean, that's where the University of Paris is. And if you think especially for like clerical education and so on, maybe that's part of what's going on there. There's a recognition that this is, you know, the seat of learning. So... We've wandered around the map a bit. One thing I want to talk about, though, before we leave our wandering to, to go on to other thematic things, is water courses. Uh, big, fancy bodies of water. I, 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 I love them in all ways, but one <laughs> of the ways I love them is on maps. And if you look at the whole uh, Hereford map, I don't know if this is the effect that you had on you, is 
I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what the heck is that? Um, at the, <laughs> the sort of two pronged Red Sea, which is yes. this, like, it's literally red. It's like, yeah. whoa. On some of the reconstructed maps, it's a, it's much clearer just how big and red that should be. Even now, right? It's and still so pretty imagine red. It, imagine yeah. it, you know, in its own time. Uh, especially thinking about, you know, the salvation history that we're talking about kind of in the background there, right? You know, we've got the last judgment at the top. We've got uh, the scene of Eden that we talked about already. Um, you know, there's there's a kind of how can I put it? We're primed to see red as blood, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so you know, the red rubrics on this map, you know, point out sites that are particularly important, but they particularly show up in connection with pilgrimage sites or other kinds of like sacred locations. And so the red is doing a lot of work there. I'm not sure that the red of the sea is the same color as the red of the rubrics of the text. Mm, you know, that's a really good question. It looks a little darker. Yeah, we'd have to look into the um, question around the pigments and stuff. Yeah, we'd have to ask an expert. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's an interesting point. But nonetheless, it's like, it's definitely vivid, right? Yeah. And it's doing all kinds of weird things, right? Like, so it's sort of in these two areas. And if you look at the sort of right horn, as it were, of the, the sea here, it's got um, uh, a line running through it as if there's like a space cut out. And if you dig down into it, you're like, well, what is that? And it turns out that that is a very, very special itinerary. Um, I think you, it caught your eye as well, right? It did. When I finally saw it, it took me a few, you know, traverses over it because it's a lot of detail. But when I finally found it, I was just like, oh my word, it's, it's the path of uh, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt and getting lost for a little while. It's so great. So, so we've got the parting of the Red Seas. So we've got this little strip of land where it can go across, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing. Then you get the sort of noodly line in the desert where it's just like, we're just going in circles. We're crossing <laughs> our tracks. It's amazing. It looks like a little kid's drawing of what, the, I mean, it's not inaccurate, but like, it's still very delightful. Well, it's doing all this cool stuff, right? So if you go to the very beginning, uh, which is sort of the lower right-hand part of the itinerary of the um, Exodus, um, there's a kind of almost like a building structure. And it says, um, here gathered the people of Israel in Ramesse in their exit from Egypt, right? So you follow that path, as you're saying, you go through the um, transit across the Red Sea. Um, here's where the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, it says. And then it's like literally like another little maze, right? The path goes down. Down, and it winds around, noodles over like this, and comes like this, splits into two at one point, right? <laughs> sort of signifying, um, sort of, I guess, division among the people, right? And then they come back together. And you can connect that to episodes in, in the book of Exodus. And then it goes on. And finally, they find their way to the city of Jericho, where it tells us about here's where uh, Moses led the uh, children of Israel. And so it's like the coolest thing. It's so good. It's almost like a little puzzle in itself. And they pass by the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and stuff like that, which that's already in the past of biblical history, right? So they're kind of walking past important sites in their own history as they make their way to the promised land. Yeah. Um, but that's just one waterway. I mean, there's a whole lot of others. And they're also doing their own special work. So I want to talk a little bit about this as a text, as a thing that we're reading as a thing that one might read. I want to I want to do some overview now that we've gotten a taste of how delightful this is. Hmm. We talked a bit about the differences in how Watchmen was able to tell a complex version of history compared with Orlando, how being a visual text, having issues of layout, having the possibility for simultaneous things happening through image and text bubble and speech bubbles that may not have to be connected to each other, how there could be a kind of overlap there that you can't have as easily, if at all, in linear text like Orlando. And now here we have another possibility entirely where you don't even have, you know, go from one panel to the next and follow it down. There are definitely some things on the map that will guide you from one point to the next, but it's it's uh, it's wide open. It's an open world concept, so to speak. You can you can your eye can go wherever it fancies, and there might be something connecting it along the way, and that's a really interesting challenge in terms of composition, uh, but also a really interesting opening of possibilities for interpretation. Yeah, no, I think there's an incredible amount of freedom that we're given to sort of wander through the map, but we're also 
I don't know, triggered or cued to move from one place to the other or to associate one place with another one that we might have seen earlier. So um, I mentioned earlier like the ways in which visual form does some of that work, you know, the circular forms of um, Jerusalem and the labyrinth on Crete and Eden and so on, right? I mean, that's one way it makes that happen. But also you find this happening, for example, through textual cues. Uh, so for example, I mentioned earlier, there are a number of sites that are associated with Alexander the Great. And um, we mentioned already the the dry tree and the altars of Alexander in the far southeast. There are also a sort of a sacred island and other altars of Alexander that are identified as being in the very far north. There are the enclosed, un- unclean tribes of Gog and Magog that Alexander is said to have hemmed in with an indestructible wall. And that's a pretty great part. That's worth a look uh, if we had time. And then there's also multiple cities named Alexandria. And so obviously you don't know when you first come to the map about all these Alexandria sites. Like you don't have an index to take you to them. But say you find one, right? Say you find, I don't know, the altars of Alexander in the southeast. Then you're looking around the map and you find these other altars of Alexander in the north, right? You're like, you know, it, it Again, it, it, it cues you to think about the story of Alexander that you might know. What other sacred sites? What other extreme limits did he encounter? So it kind of cues you to put the story together, to to connect what you see on the map to the text that lie behind it, and also to put them together into your own story, like kind of make the story again. That's what I mean by making history. I don't mean that it's like making history and that great events are happening, right? I mean making history in the sense that the making of narrative history happens as you look at the map, like you kind of produce it as you interact with the map, which I think is so cool. Yeah. The other the other side of that, I also think, is that, I mean, we don't really know how this was, so to speak, used. We don't know if it was intended for reading or for devotion or as a scholarly aid or anything. Like, we don't really know. It could be any, it could be all of these. But it's hard when I'm looking at Westrom and looking at this very lovingly annotated edition of the text and, and seeing things like, for example, the entry for Hereford, which... He lists what the text says, what the uh, transcription of literally what's on the page, and then a translation of it, all of which are just Hereford. And then on the other side, on the facing page, we've got commentary and design, which are his own notes. Hereford, the seat of a bishop since 672, is a town of central importance to the map, which has certainly been a possession of Hereford Cathedral since yada, yada, yada. You get an entire explanatory note going with it. This is Hereford on the map is all it says. You can't read more than that necessarily. But you are expected to either yourself or maybe be in the presence of somebody who can use that as a launching off point because they know about Hereford, because they've got they've read other texts about it, because there is some connection to it. Many of these entries are very brief for obvious reasons, but it, they're coming out of a system that it feels like somebody is expected to know from other contexts. So the sense of making history as well, if I can imagine somebody sort of guiding another person through it yeah, and being able to make a lot of choices about what exactly the story or the lesson that they want to give is by pointing and guiding people from one part of the map to another, filling in all those details that the map can't include and being able to elaborate on those details as they want. It's, it's an invitation to make history. It's an invitation to give you a bunch of points or places or paths which you can then fill out with the stories and the connective tissue and the moral lessons and the interpretive flavor or the excitement of a battle or whatever, of Alexander's adventures, whatever you want to do, you can do that with this map. That's exactly it. It's a tool for making history. And I guess I walk away thinking about applying that idea to other texts. It's like how many of the texts that we look at or could read can also be or are also used in that way. Mm. Certainly mm. biblical texts, we're familiar with the idea that, you know, biblical texts citing and you, you cross-referencing other parts of the Bible and that you can draw these out and tell a story. I mean, this is a very traditional part of at least the church services that I grew up with, where you get, you know, the, the lesson and the and the gospel. And then it's like, we will, in the, in the sermon, we're going to unify this and come up with a, a lesson and a meaning and, and actually make something bigger out of these two points in this text. And how 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 that uh, approach, that map reading approach, can be understood in terms of other moments of reading. Yeah, it's about making meaning, right? It's about making coherency and finding patterns in this like swath of information that's laid out in front of us. Um, yeah, and 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 in this incredibly graphic kind of way, this like visually really profound way. 
Well, here endeth the history cluster. <laughs> uh, we asked our listeners if they have any suggestions for other books that we could have done, and we got quite a lot of delightful suggestions, and we're going to pick out just a few of them. And I want to start with one that actually wasn't directed at us, but I know, Suzanne, that you have a great interest in alternate histories and sort of mm. counterfactual histories. Mm. Samuel Delaney, the author, you know, whose books we've covered on this podcast, suggested in an essay once, it wasn't just to us, that there's this book by Martin Delaney, no relation, called Blake or the Huts of America, A Tale of the Mississippi Valley, the Southern United States, and Cuba. It was written by uh, an African-American during the American Civil War. Hmm. And Delaney describes it as a strong example of what is often referred to as proto-science fiction about an imagined successful slave revolt in Cuba and the American South, which is about as close to a sci-fi style alternate history novel as you can get. Wow, that's incredibly interesting. I hey, might want to check that one out. Yeah, no, definitely. I hadn't heard of it before. Um, yeah, no, we got a ton of suggestions. Another um, sort of pair that caught my eye was Sean Frost, who mentioned Thomas Pynchon's Mason and Dixon to us, which I'd heard about, but I've never read. And it sounds like that's super interesting. They mentioned that it took about a year to to work through the book, that it was a, a kind of a lumbering, plotless thing. Um pompous in some ways, but also really worth the reading. And Jared Pekacek had said that um, one of his favorite novel series, Egypt, is something kind of similar to Mason and Dixon in terms of the ways in which it engages with the past. He says, it creates a fantastic sense of how it would feel emotionally to live in a world where the earth is just a few thousand years old, humors are real, and the stars move on spheres turned by the finger of God. I thought that sounded kind of cool. I hadn't heard of this before. Yeah, I know. Those both sounded... Well, I've I've tried to read Mason and Dixon when it first came out. Pinchon is hard to get through, right? Yeah, I got... I enjoyed it for about 200 pages. And then I was like, I have no idea what's going on. And my patience, it is out. And maybe I'll come back to this someday. And that was decades ago. And I haven't come back to it, but I still have my copy of it. The first hardcover edition was gorgeous. So just as a book object, I'm really happy to have it. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I could totally see that would be a fun engagement of history. It, you know, Mason and Dixon is written in an 18th century version of English, you know, a, not necessarily the most accurate one, but it's a fun one. Let's put it that way. And it's kind of delightful for that. John Crowley's Egypt series sound really neat. They also sound very weird. <laughs> As he said, at any moment, the story's reality is pretty slippery. Um, yeah, I, I, who knows? That could be a fun thing to do as well. It also caught my Daniel Price suggested Robertson Davies, uh, Murder and Walking Spirits. And I've never read any Robertson Davies. I don't know if you have, but I thought that sounded kind of intriguing. It probably is. Yeah, I haven't read this one, um, which is about a film critic who dies in the first paragraph and then spends the rest of the book as a ghost attending the Toronto International Film Festival screenings and <laughs> turn out to be showing <laughs> stories from the lives of his answer. Like, I what? mean, it's a great premise. <laughs> it's a fun, it's a very fun premise. Uh, that could be lots of fun. Mm. Uh, let's see, some of the ones that I got excited about, um, uh, Michael E. Richardson suggested Jordy Rosenberg's Confessions of the Fox, a novel presented as historical research that reimagines Jack Shepard as a trans man and has a bonkers second story going on in the footnotes and margins. And Michael says there's a lot of stuff doing queer retellings of history, but this one feels like the most interesting. Mm. I That sounds really fascinating. And I bet that there's tremendous amount of interesting queer reckonings with history. I mean, I know that like in history, the discipline, there have been some really interesting interventions in queering our sense of history. Mm. And I'm sure that's happening in novels as well. And another one that I got excited by, Catherine Parrish suggested Graham Nelson's Jigsaw, which is a piece of interactive fiction, something you play on your computer, like old Infocom games, if anyone's familiar with that. It's from the 90s. It's a classic of sort of the new wave of interactive fiction. I played it a long time ago. It is very hard, but in it, you, you're a time traveler, basically, and you encounter all sorts of historical things. And you're in control, right? You're typing into a parser, go north, pick up the thing, talk to the person, and so forth. So this idea of personally navigating navigating history through this game structure is really striking. And it's a well-written game. Um, the Infocom game Trinity, which is about the Manhattan Experiment, is also a classic, which I have never actually played, but totally would be an interesting way of approaching history. I just knew that I couldn't get you to do them. <laughs> well, <laughs> this might be bonus material, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
One of the other books that caught my eyes, Rick Godden suggested um, Walter M. Miller Jr.'s A Canticle for Leibowitz, which is a book I've heard of, but I've um, never picked up. I don't know if you've ever picked it up. He says, I appreciated its grand sweep of history and the illegibility of the past, and its sci-fi nature slowly creeps in and surprises you. Yeah, I, I have never read it. And only just a few days ago before he mentioned this, did I find out that it was actually a sci-fi book? I, I thought it was something completely different. Um, I clearly don't know enough about this book to say, and I probably should learn more because a lot of people do love that book. It's been neat, I think, how you know when we think about history, science fiction for some reason has kind of been right there on the threshold. Yeah, I think especially if you're looking for interesting engagements with history, science fiction is is there for you. Like it it, it lets you do things. And so several of the books that we picked could arguably, you know, you could arguably say that Orlando and Watchmen are both science fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. You could also suggest that a lot of the books that we talked about last time when we said the other books that we were thinking about are also science fiction. And several of these books have been. So science fiction and history play together in interesting ways. Totally. And of course, many people recommended War and Peace, which is a very, very big book, and I didn't feel like reading it. I, I don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet. <laughs> I've never read any of the big Russian novels. You know, I have a really hard time with. Um, I, I've tried reading different um, pieces of Russian literature, and I found I kind of bounced off it. And I'm wondering if maybe I was not choosing good translations. Maybe this is something we should, you know, take under advisement and see if we can find something that we'd like to read, whether it's War and Peace or something else. If this podcast doesn't finally get me to read one. Nothing ever will. <laughs> <laughs> Same. So this concludes our history cluster, and this is going to conclude our main set of clusters for this year. And we're going to wrap up next time with our traditional end of the year in memoriam episode for somebody who passed away in 2021. And as you probably can guess from the announcement that we made at the beginning of the previous episode, we're going to be looking at a book by Lee Maracle. Yeah, it'll be good to do that. It's been a really sad time, but it will be good to read her work and think about her teaching and, you know, how much pleasure we've gotten out of her writing. Yeah. We are planning on looking at I Am Woman, which is a collection of thoughts on indigenous feminism. Uh, that book is currently out of print and being reprinted, and it's unclear when that will be available broadly, but we're going to do the episode. We're going to try to get our hands on copies. We'll do the episode, and hopefully in a few months, it'll be available for you to read along with if if you'd like. So look forward to that. And one of the things I'm glad about is even though we, we've gotten a chance to know her work fairly well, this is a book of hers that neither one of us has read before. So it'll be a nice chance to kind of meet something new um, from her. Exactly. Well, until then, if you'd like to get in touch with us, listener, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you, and thank you for everybody who wrote in with your book suggestions. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 50, and The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time... Until next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn. Thank you.